We have so much to praise the Lord Jesus for because of what he's done in our lives, how he saved us, and who he is. It's our great joy to sing his praises together. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. And the theme of Hebrews chapter 11, 12, and 13 is just like it says on the slide, looking to Jesus. But the theme of the entire book of Hebrews, the theme of the whole book, could be summed up in one word, and it's the word better, better. If it was a a math symbol, it would be the greater than sign. The whole theme of this book is that Jesus is better, and that what we've been given is better than anything and everything else. And you and I could talk and, and laugh and disagree warm-heartedly about what's better. Who really has better custard? Culver's or Cops? Who really makes better coffee? Starbucks or McDonald's? Amy and I are united in the fact that McDonald's coffee is better than Starbucks. And if you hate us for that, We don't hate you. We love you, but we accept your hate, proving that you are inferior to us because (laughs) Starbucks coffee just isn't that good. We could could have trivial disagreements about what's better, Marvel or DC. We could have maybe a little more significant conversation about what's better, the weather in Southern California (laughs) or the weather in Wisconsin. Or we could have a significant conversation today at lunch over wings. Who has a better basketball team, Boston or Milwaukee? We could have uh, actually a really serious conversation that I've had with many of you. Well, would you pray that I'll know which cancer treatment is better one to pursue? The better that we come to today in Hebrews chapter 12, specifically verse 24, is the biggest one of all. You know, the word better is used 13 times in the book of Hebrews. It's only used six times in every other book of the New Testament. So we have more than double, take all the New Testament, more than double of its uses are here in Hebrews, and it shows up 13 times the ultimate time, the final time that it shows up is here in this verse, in verse 24 that we'll cover today. Hebrews has already told us that in Jesus, we have a better hope. Look at Hebrews 7, verses 19 through 25. It says in Hebrews 7, verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And then going on, it says in 7 verse 20, and it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. For this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn forever and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. There's our word again in verse 22, of a better covenant. Look at the contrast. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 8 verse 6 says that we've been given better promises Hebrews 8, verse 23 says that Jesus is a better sacrifice. I'm sorry, Hebrews 9, verse 23. Look at that. 9, verse 23 says he's the better sacrifice. Thus it was necessary, 9, 23, for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
And just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. Better sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 says that we willingly gave up our possessions because we have better possessions, 1034. Hebrews 11 says that we are seeking a better home or a better country or a better fatherland in Hebrews 11, verse 16. We're willing to give up what we have here because we have a better home. And even in chapter 11, verse 35, it says we're waiting for a better resurrection. But the final and greatest use of the word better is in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24. Hebrews is a study in contrast between the old and the new, between all of the sacrifices and the final sacrifice of Christ, between imperfect and not yet fulfilled and the great fulfillment in the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And specifically, this section, Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 24, summarizes all the main themes in the epistle to the Hebrews. If you've ever watched a two-hour movie, 120 minutes total, and maybe somewhere around minute 108 or 110, they play some music and there's a montage of clips from the first 110 minutes of the movie that, that just remind you leading up to the final act in the film. This paragraph is snippets of everything that's already been mentioned in the book of Hebrews. Angels, heaven, the firstborn, perfection, the new covenant, the old covenants, the law, grace, the blood of Jesus. This is the climactic point that the author's been building to. In fact, Hebrews chapter 13 is uh, like... The, almost like the sermon's <laughs> finished and he kind of sits down with the people and says, now before I sign off, I want to remind you of a couple of important things. But the rhetorical argument goes from chapter one through chapter 12. And then 13 is, is all the, the, not just personal, but corporate admonitions that he has to give them. So here we have our text in Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 24. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire in darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not enter the order, they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. As we read that text together, when I, I diagram almost every text that I'm going to preach from, and if you made a diagram or picked out the key features of this text, it is not difficult to do. You see there in verse 18, in verse 18 it says, for you have not come, for you have not come. And then you see in verse 22, but you have come. You have not come, and then verse 22, but you have come. And when I put those in two different columns, then I actually found that it was seven in each column. The first thing, it says, you have not come, and then he lists seven things. And then verse 22, but you have come, and he lists seven things up through the end of verse 23. So it's seven and then seven, and then verse 24 begins, and to Jesus, and this adds two more. So the first one that we didn't come to has seven. The second one that we have come to has seven equaling the first seven, but then in verse 24, it adds on, and to Jesus, and two more. This is the contrast. You have not come, but you have come. The contrast is between two mountains. The first mountain was the law, the old covenant, 
the mount where Moses delivered the law. It showed God's holiness. And it brought the fear that the law of God should always bring into everyone's heart because we see that we have failed. The second mountain is the mountain where Christ dwells, where the blood of Christ covers our law breaking. It's the mountain where we dwell now by faith and it's the mountain where we'll dwell forever in the final eschaton. The first half is verses 18 through 21. And then we have the but you have come in verse 22 that leads us to the second half. So let's talk a little bit about the first half. The first half is about Mount Sinai, the mountain where Moses climbed to receive the law of God on behalf of Israel. And when Moses climbed up that mountain, it was with a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the ears beg that they wouldn't want to hear anymore and they couldn't even endure it. And if even a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned. This is how, this is how serious the scene was. Moses warned the people not to touch the mountain. Why couldn't they touch the mountain? Because God's presence was on the mountain. And the presence of God set that mountain apart and consecrated it as holy. The earthquakes and the smoke and the fire all symbolize the inapproachable holiness of God, that God cannot be approached, that he's too pure, too pristine, and too holy. Under the old covenant, God was, so to speak, inaccessible. Only one person, the high priest, could enter the presence of God. And that one person could only enter the presence of God at one day, the day of atonement. It even says there, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. He begins with the ignorant beasts. He ends with, uh, so to speak, the greatest Israelite of them all, Moses. And it says Moses, the strongest, most holy of all of them, was trembling with fear. And even the beasts who, though they couldn't comprehend the commandments, wouldn't even themselves be spared from death showing us how inflexibly strict the law of God is. Here we are at God's greatness. How does someone like me actually speak of the greatness of God? Words fail. God's not the greatest. God is is great on a different order of existence. He's a different kind and type of being altogether. It's not like we could all write, you know, just just a huge whiteboard and write every great thing we could think of and then amplify it to talk about that's how great God is. Anselm, God is that being than which nothing greater can be thought. God is that someone, the one, of whom no one greater can even be conceived. God is that endless, eternal, uncaused, unceasing, unchanging fire of holy life from which all else derives its existence. But God is the only being whose existence is his essence. He doesn't have features. He is himself. Is the only one of whom that is true. And A.W. Tozer in his uh, classic book, The Knowledge of the Holy, comes close when he simply says this, we cannot grasp the true meaning of God's holiness. This dude is writing a book about God's holiness and this is what he says. We cannot grasp the true meaning of God's holiness. So why not close the book, right? He says, we cannot grasp the true meaning of God's holiness by thinking of someone or something very pure and then raising that concept to the highest degree. 
God's holiness is not simply the best we know, infinitely bettered. Even infinitely bettering something we understand is not good enough. That's what he's saying. God's holiness is not simply the best we know, infinitely bettered. We know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. The thrice holy God, as it were, must, must carve a new channel of knowing into our heart and our mind for us to even begin to apprehend what it means that he's holy. And this infinitely holy God is the one whose law we've broken. So the blood that must cover our law breaking must satisfy an infinitely, gloriously, fiery, holy, wrathful God. This is all to set up that first mountain which, which shows us the holiness of God and to show us what we have been given in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, the one who's better. And so from the first half of the contrast, verses 18 through 21, we have that swing statement in verse 22, but you have come. And then he mentions Mount Zion. Mount Zion is Jerusalem. It's a city that was captured by David in uh, 2 Samuel 5. These uh, folks who sit behind us in the second and third row, last week they were just showing us pictures of their trip to Jerusalem that they took a couple weeks ago. You still go there. Is this ancient city captured by David. The, the, the first capturing of it is there in 2 Samuel 5. But it came to be identified not as Zion, but as Jerusalem. Now, the way he speaks of it here, he begins speaking of it as the earthly city of Jerusalem. But there's a double meaning here. And the referent is not only to the earthly Jerusalem, but also to the final eschatological or heavenly city. It stands for where the saints will dwell forever. And he says here that we've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. A couple of times in the Bible, it says that one angel appeared and the human being to whom one angel appeared fell over like a dead person, right? What would, what would our response be to innumerable angels? How quickly would we disintegrate to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. All the names of believers who are heirs of God are written down. Your name. There's no way I could go through here and name every one of you. I'd be lucky if I remembered four of your names. Every single name of those who are washed in the blood of Jesus is written on the roll in heaven. You know, Lisa, who helps run our office, she called me up to her office last week or week before. And she said, look at this. And she was going through some, some old things we had here and she showed me a roll, a, a, a pen written roll of the original charter members of the Union Tabernacle in 1927 when this church began written down there started as the layman's bible league and the, that that role was preserved i'm glad she found it. i'm glad we're holding on to it this says that all those who belong in heaven their names are written it says there in in uh verse 23 that the names are enrolled in heaven what was it, three weeks ago in ABF? We were covering Luke chapter 10, verse 20, where Jesus sends out the 72 and they come back and they, they had this successful mission and they're like, Satan fell like lightning and serpents and scorpions and the demons are subject to us. And remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. 
the Apostle Paul had to deal with uh, like a couple of, um, I don't know what you'd call them, cranky church ladies in Philippians chapter four. I love this. He's, Paul, they send to Paul like everyone's freaking out because these two ladies are cranky with each other. And Paul says in Philippians four, I just love this, how he goes from the mundane to the cosmic. Paul says in Philippians four, I entreat you, Odian Syntyche, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask also, true companion, help these women who have labored by my side with me in the gospel together and they are with my fellow workers. Their names are written in the book of life. They tell Paul, like, these ladies had a fight last Thursday. Can you fix it? And Paul's like, yeah, I'll fix it. And just like he's dealing with these ladies who had a fight last Thursday. And then he says, and they should get along because their names are like right, written right next to mine in the book of life. This is, this, this, is, this is where our unity comes from. Church, I'm, I'm restraining myself. I'm not about to go off, but just listen. Our unity does not come from who we voted for in the last election. Our unity does not come from our age or our this or our that. Our unity comes from the fact that we are in Christ and our names are written right next to each other forever. I'm sure the, the, the reply of these cranky ladies was, well, I'm sure we'll get along in heaven, but we hate each other down here. And the apostle's like, that's not why I said your names are written in heaven. So that you could be, you know, so that you could just, so that one day you'd get along. This is the beginning realization of that final day. That's what Hebrews 12 keeps saying, is that the saints in heaven are worshiping Jesus. And right now we are beginning that. It's like, the, like uh, eternity is just that, that eternal state is tipping forward into the worship of the church right now. So he says our names are enrolled in heaven. And then uh, if you see there in, in verse 23, look at what it says. This, this kind of stopped me in my tracks. To the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, comma, the judge of all, comma, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now when the Bible says God, and then it gives a definitive clause of who God is, we could, we could easily think of 200 non-heretical things that could be in that little comma off clause. God, the creator. God, the sustainer. God, you know, everything that he could have said about God, about God, but for some reason, he chooses to say God, the judge. Well, for those whose names are not written in heaven, God is their judge, and he will judge them in wrath and in hell forever. But it says here that we have come to the heavenly city and we've come to God. And when it names God or when it kind of qualifies definitionally who God is, it says that God is judge. I'm telling you, this, this is like gospel with a, with a jalapeno spicy kick inside of it. This is like 80 proof gospel. Because he's saying that we're going to come to heaven. And he actually has the, the nerve to define the God before whom we appear in heaven as God the judge. God the judge. And we get to walk into heaven and land there in some sort of mansion arrangement and we get to, to belong. What this is saying is that when we appear before God, the judge of all eternally, God will, as it were, eternally vindicate us in his presence and say, they are just, they are righteous, they belong here. How can this be? It's because of how the paragraph ends that we've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The contrast here is between Christ who has fulfilled the law and the smoking gloom of Mount Sinai where the law that was declared is only broken and broken and broken and broken. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, he in no way disparaged the law. Jesus and then the apostles after him made a great 
point of saying we didn't, Jesus did not come to set aside or invalidate or nullify the law. Jesus came to fulfill it, to accomplish it. And this he did. He fulfilled the law of God to the letter. He fulfilled it in his spirit. And so because Jesus fulfilled the law, when we look back at Sinai where the law was given, we look at the law as fulfilled in Jesus. So it's sort of like if you could imagine, maybe this is a little cartoonish, being at the gates of heaven and whoever's there at the gate is not saying many, many confusing things. Whoever's there at the gate is saying one thing. This is the one thing that that gatekeeper is saying. Only those who have perfectly obeyed the law of God can enter here. Only those who have perfectly obeyed the law of God can enter here. What is our reply? My only hope is to say, there is one who is my champion. There is one who is my elder brother. There is one who is my bridegroom, as it were. There is one who has placed his name upon me and my divine champion has fulfilled the law of God in my place. And I wouldn't stop there. I would say to the gatekeeper, if in fact you must slay me for having broken the law and my death is required, there is one who, whom you have already slain in my place. My blood was already shed in Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, my all. This is the contrast that he's building this entire epistle to, to come down here between these two mountains. This beautiful contrast, this sharp contrast, leads to a serious consequence. And it's the same consequence that, has been, that he's been hammering on for these 12 chapters. The people to whom he's speaking are about to give up. The people to whom he's speaking are going to let persecution silence them. The people to whom he's speaking are looking at the promises of the gospel and looking at the present fulfillment of the satisfaction of sin and they're saying, I'm not sure it's worth it. Maybe I should just go for the present satisfaction. And the consequence here is, it's almost as if I could argue like this, if, if we were still at that first mountain, well, your sinning and your quitting wouldn't be excusable. But it's like, you, uh, you, you, would, it was, you would still have this in, incomplete state and maybe your reasons for giving up would make some kind of sense. But you have come not to the first mountain. You have come to Christ. You have come to God, the judge of all, who will eternally vindicate you because of what Jesus has done. Therefore, whatever excuse you have for giving up on church, whatever excuse you have for sinning, it will never, ever fly because of what you've been given, because of where you are. Go on and give all your best arguments for why you, should, you can give up on this church. They won't pass muster. Go ahead and give all the reasons why just a little bit of compromise into sin will be okay. They won't pass. Because you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and the innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And now we finally look together at verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. A, a better word than the blood of Abel. Hebrews chapter 11 began with Abel. Look at Hebrews 11 and we'll see the word Abel. It's the first name that's mentioned in, in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he has commended, he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Hebrews 11 started with Abel because, well, for the obvious reason that after Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel were the first two. And he's not going to use Cain as an example of faith, so he's going to use Abel. But Abel is also used beginning of Hebrews 11 because Abel was killed. And the audience to whom Hebrews 11 was first written, we're the secondary audience, the primary audience for whom Hebrews 11 was written were those who were about to be killed, those who were about to be killed for their faith. And so in a, in a, in a marvelous sort of hope-filled pastoral exhortation, he is saying to those who are about to be killed, here's an example of someone who was killed and to this day, he is still speaking because of his loyalty to God. You are about to be killed. Don't think that your death will silence you. You will still speak of the wonder of God even in your death. And then uh, he speaks of the blood of Abel speaking. In, in 11.24, it says the sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Why do we talk about blood speaking? Well, we see that in Genesis 4. If you just turn back quickly to Genesis 4, this is where this very phrase comes from. Genesis 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew, his, knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel, now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had a regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me, to me from the ground. Cain brought an offering of the first fruits of the harvest. Abel brought a lamb from his flock, the first blood sacrifice. Hebrews is all about blood sacrifice. The first blood sacrifice here brought by a person was brought by Abel. Abel offered one lamb for himself, one lamb for one man. Next book, we'll hear the Passover. And in the Passover, the instruction is one lamb for one man family. And then in the next book, we'll hear the instructions for the day of atonement. In the day of atonement, it's one lamb for the whole nation. And then in the New Testament, when we turn the page to John chapter 1, and that skinny, bony finger of John the Baptist pointing to Jesus and saying, behold, one lamb for the cosmos, for the whole world. And in the Genesis narrative, after Abel, who brought blood to God, is himself killed, it is his blood that cries out to God. Genesis 4, verse 10. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Can you imagine it? It's already kind of a shockingly imaginative thing to say that blood cries out because blood has no vocal cords. 
It is an evocative image. Cain slew Abel, I don't know exactly how, let's say it was with a rock or with a knife. Either way, it would have been a bloody mess. Striking his brother over and over and over again until Abel's blood was splattered all over the field, all over the ground. And then, let's imagine, in heaven, the angels say, we have never heard that sound. God, what is that sound? Such a discordant sound has never come from that planet below us ever before. And God replies to them, that is the cry of human blood. A man was slain by his brother. And now the blood of the man who was slain is crying out to me. And it is saying vengeance. It's saying wrath. It's saying judgment. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And so we move and we move and we move ahead to the end of Matthew, the end of Mark, the end of Luke, the end of John, when Jesus, not the son of Adam, but the son of God, is nailed to a tree and his blood is splattered everywhere. Abel murdered by his brother. Jesus murdered by the crowd of his, uh, the, the, the crowd of basically all of us. We're Cain in his story. And his blood from his five wounds, two on his hands, two on his feet, one in his side, is splattered on the ground. And if we can imagine that in heaven, the angels say, God, what is that sound? We have never heard anything like it from the history of the world. What is that sound? And God says, that is the cry of the blood of my only begotten and beloved son. And what it is saying to me is forgive, mercy, pardon, satisfaction. The blood of Jesus cries out for forgiveness where the blood of Abel cried out for vengeance. Abel's blood cried out for judgment. The blood of Jesus cries out judgment satisfied, it is finished. The blood of Abel represented, the blood of Abel represented the guilt of the sinners who murdered him. The blood of Jesus represents nothing less than the newfound innocence of the sinners who murdered him. This is what he accomplished on his cross. Isaac Watts wrote in one of his hymns, blood has a voice to pierce the skies, revenge the blood of Abel cries, but the dear stream when Christ was slain speaks peace as it flows from every vein. It's as if he opened up his body so that his very blood could be spilled out to cry out forgiveness. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And the text is pressing and pressing and pressing a battered and tempted church to hold on. And the reason to hold on, the reason to say no to giving up and to say no to sin is nothing less than this. You have not come to that old mountain but you have come to Jesus whose blood speaks a better word. Oh, church, let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has washed us with his blood. He has brought us nigh to God. Let's pray.
as we bow for prayer, I'd ask you to think on the blood of Jesus. And thank him for salvation. In prayer, would you just tell him again, Lord Jesus, because I have come to the better blood that speaks a better word, Lord Jesus, there's nothing I desire beside you. Would you tell him again that when you feel like giving up, you won't. That when you feel like giving in to temptation, you won't. Not because you're so strong, but because his blood is so precious. And if you're here today and you're not certain that you're saved, behold, today is the day of salvation. You simply cry out, I, I can't save myself. But Jesus, I understand that you saved me at the cross, I believe. Jesus, hear your little lambs as we pray. Give us faith. Give us trust. Give us a, a, a consistent joy in the word that your blood speaks over us and for us. Lord Jesus, hear your lambs as they pray and shepherd them faithfully. Jesus, this is our prayer in your name. Amen. It is with hearts filled with thankfulness that we close our service. It's with hearts filled with thankfulness that we have not come to the old mountain and the unfulfilled law, but we have come to Jesus and the better word that his sprinkled blood speaks over us. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you as you go. Amen.